you'll take your Bibles and open them to the very end of the Old Testament, to the book of Malachi. Because this morning we are launching a series in study of this important prophetic book. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time studying Malachi, and every time I come to read it, I'm stunned by its message. I'm stunned by the relevance of the message. A book that was written in the mid to late 400s BC has so much to offer us as the people of God today. I'm stunned by the promise the message offers because providentially, God preserved Malachi at the end of the Old Testament to help us anticipate the coming of Christ. But the part of the message of Malachi that really grabs my heart every time is the declaration that God makes of his love for his people. The love of God is a compelling message that runs through the book of Malachi, his persistent, faithful, covenant love for his people. And the, why, the reason why it's so arresting to my heart is because the people of God did not deserve it. At the end of the Old Testament, when Malachi is writing his prophetic work, the people of God are a mess. And let me just take a moment at the beginning of this series to help us understand the state of God's people. In the mid to late 400s BC, the people of God have returned to the land of promise after many years in exile. They've been living in captivity under foreign powers. After David and Solomon ruled over the kingdom of Israel, there was a, a golden age under their rule and reign. But shortly thereafter, the kingdom began to falter. It divided and moved into greater and greater disobedience, greater and greater displays of unfaithfulness to God and the covenant that he made with them. God's people worshiped idols. They trusted in foreign governments and king more than the Lord, their God. They lived for their own pleasure rather than for the pleasure of God. They forgot the covenant that God made with them and the requirements of that covenant and the favor that God wanted to show his people, pour out over his people. And because God's people transgressed this covenant, because they went after false gods, God acted for the sake of his name and for the sake of his own people. He acted to lead them to repentance by allowing them to be conquered, conquered by foreign powers and removed from this land of promise. He wanted them to remember their need for him, not to take for granted the favor he was showing them. And that was shown in the land of promise. The covenant and the land, they went together. And so in order to help God's people remember, he removed them from the land to help them remember their covenant. Israel, the northern kingdom, fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C., while Judah, the southern kingdom, fell to the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And as you read the, the Old Testament account of this judgment and the conquering, the, the judgment that God brought upon his people was hard, devastating. When the southern kingdom was destroyed, the Bible tells us the holy city of Jerusalem and the temple, the holy temple, the meeting place between God and man was destroyed. And the people of God were distraught. They were overwhelmed by the discipline of God. But as God always does, in these moments of judgment over his people, he also offers a glimmer of hope God promised through various prophets that this exile would not last forever. It would be temporary. And that God would eventually restore his people. He would bring them back to the land of promise and allow them to rebuild. Because God would never give up on that promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He would never forget his covenant with the people of Israel. And right before Malachi pro uh, prophesies, God shows himself faithful to this promise. As we read in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, the people return. He allows the, the Persians to overthrow the Babylonians and the Persian king shows favor to the people of God. He allows them to return and progressively rebuild in the land of promise. So they rebuild the temple. They rebuild the city and her walls. And yet, in spite of this miraculous return, and in spite of 
God showing himself to be faithful once again to everything he promised. The people of God are a mess. They aren't filled with joy. They're not filled with gratitude. However, the Bible tells us that they are living in callous disobedience. In the book of Malachi, we see that God's people are half-hearted in their worship to God. They're offering lame and sick animals as sacrifices when they have better to give. They're being led by priests who are okay with the people of God offering these insulting offerings and worship. They treat their marriages with indifference. They ignore their marital covenant in much the same way they are ignoring their covenant with God and they are robbing God by not providing for the ministry of the temple. You see, the return to the land of promise didn't bring about all that the people hoped. Life is still hard. Yes, they're back in their land, but life is hard. Persia is still powerful. And while Persia did allow them to return, showing them favor, Persia's at war with a lot of people. And guess who they're taxing to help pay for those, ro- those wars? Israel feels a burden as they still serve, as they still live under Persian rule. So they begin to ask questions like this in their heart and conversations around a fire at night. These murmurings of doubt begin to creep up on their lips. What good is serving the Lord if this is what it gets us? If God's not gonna give us his best, then why on earth should we give him our best? And their hard-heartedness toward God, forgetting their sin that led them there to begin with, begins to show up in their worship and their everyday lives. And God sees the resentment in the heart of his people. He's offended by the worship that they're offering. And so he raises up Malachi to call them to repentance. But what is stunning to me, what is stunning to me is the way, the way God calls his people to repentance through Malachi. He calls them to repentance with a declaration of love. Of love. Because God knows that Nothing will truly change in the heart of his people if they are not arrested, captivated by the love that he has for them. God wants them to know and us to know as his people today that it's the love of God that leads us to repentance. It's the love of God that that causes us to want to live lives that are honoring and glorifying to him. The, The love of God leads us to live lives of obedience, Their biggest issue, the reason why they were a mess is because they had forgotten God's unique love for them. Maybe this morning you are in a similar situation. Maybe this morning you're here and you know that you should know that God loves you and yet for some reason you don't feel it. Maybe your circumstances in life have asked have led you to ask a similar question to the question the people of God were asking back then in Malachi's time. If this is what following God gets us, what is the point? But this morning, would you hear the word of God through the prophet Isaiah, or Malachi, excuse me. Isaiah says it too, but Malachi is here. Would you hear the word of God through the prophet Malachi, would you ask him to help him, help you hear what it is that God wants to proclaim over his people this morning and believe in your heart that God loves you? That he would show you his love for you and draw you close once again. Because while it is true that we will not see, experience the full blessing of God's love Until eternity, friends, we have enough now, enough taste, enough knowledge of how he has loved us to sustain us in any circumstance. Malachi chapter one, verses one through five. Here's what God says through the prophet Malachi. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Well, is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, and yet I have loved Jacob. But Esau I have hated. 
I've laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we're shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes will see this and you will say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Now, these are complicated words that God speaks through Malachi to his people. But what I hope that you will see by the end of our time today is the heart, the heart of God for his chosen people. And I want us to hear it and see it because it's a message that we need to receive as God's people today. And there are two parts to this message that I want to make sure that we wrap our minds around. Here's the first part. God is declaring to his people his love for them. He is communicating it with words. He is saying to them, I love you. Malachi comes to the Israelite people and he offers them a message, but it's not his message. It's an oracle. It's a message from God to his people. And this word oracle means a burden. And so God has given Malachi this message that's a burden upon him. He's constrained by the spirit of God, moved by God to have to go to this people and unload it upon the people, not as a burden for them, but as a source of joy. He's under compulsion because God is making him, he's using his body as a vessel to declare his love for his people. That's the message Essentially, the message that Malachi is called to proclaim over the people of God. And I hope that this stirs your heart. God wants you. He wants his people to know how much he loves them. He raises up this prophet to speak it, to shout it, to declare to them his love. Listen, he says, I know that some of you don't feel this right now. I know that some of you are doubting my love for you. And I hear you talking about this, but you need to hear me. Don't listen to the people around you. Don't listen to the, the seeds of doubt in your mind. You need to hear me. I love you. I have loved you. I still love you. And I will love you. I've not forgotten my covenant. I will remember it. I have chosen you out of all the peoples of the world. And that has not changed. Now listen, this was not the first time that God had declared his love for his people. He told them from the beginning. As he established their covenant relationship in Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8, he says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you because you were the fewest of all the people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And even in the period of exile, God continues to remind his people of his love for them. Jeremiah 31, three, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Lamentations 3 that we read earlier today, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God had said it, and it's enough for God to say it once. He only has to say it once because his words are true and they never change. The people of God here, they could have gone back in the history, the annals of God's people, the other prophecies that had come before. They could have opened up the scroll of Deuteronomy and read that God had said at one time, he loved us. They could have talked about what Jeremiah prophesied over them in exile, and yet they did not. It was enough for God to say it once, but here is the grace of God shown to them. He takes time to say it again, because they needed to hear it again. They needed to hear it afresh. And so think about the importance of, of this act of grace of God for us, church family. Before he ever addresses their sin, and there's a lot of sin to address among the people of God. Before, before he ever speaks a word about their behavior, God speaks to their heart. Because if the heart's not right, nothing will be right. 
Here's a biblical truth that we can celebrate this morning, church family. When it comes to our responsibility before the Lord, relationship always precedes requirement. Let me say it again. Relationship always precedes requirement. God always, it's amazing to me, even in our brokenness and our sin, God always calls us to himself first before he sets forth expectations for us to live in obedience. I read one commentator that said it this way. God didn't send Moses to rescue his people out of Egypt with the tablets underneath his cloak. Right? He sent Moses to redeem them and deliver them to display his choice of them, to display his love for them through the miraculous deliverance through the Egyptian exodus moment. And then, once he had saved them, once he had called them out, then he begins to unveil fully the responsibility and requirements of living as the people of God. You see, the expectations that we have as the people of God to live lives that are glorifying to him, they must be done out of a heart of love for them to be glorifying to him and good for us. We can only love God and live lives that evidence the love of God if we are first shown and believe the love that he has for us. We love God because he first loved us. And so be overwhelmed this morning by the love of God and hear his declaration, God's steadfast commitment to his covenant and his people, the way he shows kindness and pours out favor and blessing upon them. That's the foundation of our repentance. It's the foundation of our obedience. And that's why Malachi begins, why God commands Malachi to begin this prophetic message with a declaration of love. God speaks to his people of his love. But secondly, he also acts. God acts to show his love to his people. And yes, speaking is an action, but God's gonna do something even more profound to evidence his love, his unique love for his people. God's words are not empty words. He acts, he always follows through on what he says. He's faithful and by his grace, he offers proof to his people of the sincerity of this declaration of love. So the people of God, when they hear the declaration, their first response is a question. And we'll see this a lot throughout the book of Malachi. It's kind of how the book is structured. God declares something over his people and then they respond with, oh yeah, what about this? And so God says, I love you. And what's their response? How? Okay, God, how have you loved us? But see the grace of God here. Instead of laughing at the ridiculous question, and in some ways it's a ridiculous question, right? I mean, there's a whole record of how God has loved his people. But instead of laughing at it or writing them off, for doubting or saying, you know what, guys, I have, I have showed you my covenant love for 400 years longer. And if you, if you can't wrap your mind around this by now, I'm just done. I'm out. That's not what God does. Look at the grace. He gives them visible evidence of his love. Now, this evidence is given in a comparison between the nations of Israel and Edom, and we need a little bit more background here to help us understand the point that, that God is making through Malachi. The history of Israel and Edom begins all the way back in Genesis 25. And there are two brothers, twins, that have an interesting encounter, and their names are Jacob and Esau. They're the sons of, a of Isaac and his wife, Rebecca. Isaac was the son of Abraham. And so they're born, Esau comes out first. He's the firstborn. And therefore, he's supposed to receive the birthright. And then, of course, Jacob is born second. But something interesting happens in their story in Genesis 25, verses 29 to 34. Let me read that for you. I think it's going to be on the screen. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, hey, let me have some of that red stew because I'm exhausted. And therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, all right, 
I'll give you some stew, but hey, sell me your birthright right now. Esau said, I'm about to die. What good's a birthright to me if I die from hunger? And Jacob said, no, you need to swear to me right now. And so Esau swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread, he gave him lentil stew, and he ate and drank and went on his way. And this is what the Bible says. Thus Esau despised his birthright. That's a really puzzling encounter in Genesis 25 around this birthright. A lot of blessing flows from the birthright. And it's no accident that Esau came out first. The order of his birth was ordained by God and yet also was this change. Because even in the womb, God said to Rebekah that the younger would rule over the older. The older would serve the younger. And so God is doing something specific here to teach us and his people something. This, this promise that God made to Rebekah in the womb is playing out in Genesis 25. And it's not just because that stew was really good stew. God's doing something. Esau thought so little of his birthright that he was willing to sell it to his younger brother for food because he was hungry. And Jacob takes advantage of this and eventually secures the blessing of his father, yes, through deception. But he's the one. He's the one now through whom the line, the promise of redemption runs through. And as these families grow, the two men form nations. Jacob's descendants become Israel. Esau's descendants become Edom. And the tension that was felt from their birth in the womb is felt among the peoples. And while it's true that God never forgot Esau, he chose to bless Jacob in a unique way. He always had a greater plan for Jacob and the descendants of Jacob. They were of primary concern to God because of the covenant he had made and his larger redemptive work. They were the people of promise. Now listen, there were times where the Edomites benefited from the gracious redemptive work that God was doing on behalf of Israel to bless other nations through Israel. But, but Edom was never the focus. And so they resented that. They resented that. And there were times because they, they knew the story and they knew that they were supposed to be the ones. They were supposed to be the chosen nation of God. And yet there was a resentment there that translated into the way that they engaged with one another. They, they war, Edomites war against Israel, war against God's people. They, they fail to help them in times of need. They don't honor the Lord. And the Lord says, as a result of the way that you treat me and the way that you treat my people, Edom, eventually I'm gonna wipe you off the face of the planet. He says that in Ezekiel 25. Now come back to Malachi 1. In Malachi 1, God reminds the people of Israel they could have been Edom. While there's tension in Edom because they know they could have been Israel, God needs to remind Israel, you could have been Edom. Because Edom has suffered in much the same way. They've been oppressed by Babylon as well. And yet, and yet, God has acted for Israel's sake. He brought about Persia to overthrow Babylon. Not for Edom's sake, for Israel's sake. Because God is doing something greater through them. They are being blessed uniquely, called out uniquely, so that all the nations can be blessed, not through Edom, but through Israel. And so God says, don't mistake what's happening here in this moment. I've chosen you, not them. In fact, I've made a promise about them. In the very near future, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the planet. They're not going to have a country to go back to. And that proves true. And I want you to know that when that happens... It's an evidence of the fact that I have still chosen you. That, that you, that you are my people, not them. In fact, my love for you is so great that it looks like hate for the people of Eden. So don't mistake. Don't mistake what's happening right now, but watch as I orchestrate the events of the world as I move nations for my glory and your good. God wants his people to know that he loves them. He wants them to hear it and he wants them to see it. 
so they can trust it and rest it in the rest in it in the middle of any circumstance. Because what else matters if God loves us? What else matters more than the truth that God loves us? Now, how should we respond, church family? to hearing this message for God's people then, but that certainly is for God's people today. The first response I think is to hear. To hear the declaration of God that he loves us. God raised up a prophet then to speak over his people this declaration of love and God is actively speaking to his word, through his word to us today as his people, this message, he loves us. God loves you. God loves me. God loves the people of Bayleaf Baptist Church. And he sovereignly orchestrated the recording of this book. He's he's given us the helper of the Holy Spirit to even now declare to us this timeless message of his love for us. Think about the gift that we have right now. God raised up prophets, apostles to write these words under the hand of the Holy Spirit. He sent his son, the word of God, not an intermediary, but the actual living word of God to declare his love for us. And he preserved all of it so that he can speak to us now. Here's what's incredible. As the Holy Spirit moves upon us to illuminate the word of God. Every time we hear the word of God proclaimed in the spirit, it's God speaking these things afresh and anew to us. It's as if we're hearing them for the first time so that God can use them to encourage us and continue to draw us, our hearts, to himself. It's not a stretch to say that the Bible could be declared a love letter from God to his people. What an incredible thing to think about. Listen, if you are a part of the the people of God, it's because God wants you to be. He's called you to himself in a declaration of love for you and for us. He spoke into your mess and he called you to himself. He opened your ears to hear of his love and he gave you the faith to believe in it and then to act upon that in repentance. The foundation of who we are as the people of God, is the love of God. Do you need to hear this again today? I know I do. I need to hear it over and over and over again. Maybe you're in a difficult situation. Maybe you're in a difficult circumstance. One of my favorite figures of Christian history is Adoniram Judson. If you don't know this name, you should. He was the father of the American Baptist Missionary Movement, And he served in Burma, which is now Myanmar, for 38 years. And his life was difficult. Really, really tough. All in service to the Lord. At the age of 24, he and his wife, Anna, who was 23 years old, left their family, everything they knew, to move to this very difficult place to tell people about Jesus. Jesus, Burma at this time would have been considered a closed country. And so it was, you're putting your life on the line to go here and declare the gospel. Let me just give you a little scope of the difficulty here. All three of his children who are born to he and his first wife died all before the age of two. And his first wife, whom he loved dearly, also died from spotted fever and cerebral meningitis. He got married again and his second wife died And also three of the eight children that she bore died. So death surrounded this man. Not only that, during his first marriage to Anne, Adoniram was wrongfully imprisoned as a spy by the hands of the Burmese government for 17 months in the worst of circumstances. And what made it more difficult was he was watching his wife who was sick, trying to feed their children who were sick. In fact, the government let him out for a little bit to go and beg with his wife for people to look kindly on them and give food for these kids who eventually would not make it. And after Anne's Anne's death and the death of the third child, Adoniram, understandably, went into a very dark place. And on the third anniversary of his wife's death, here's what he wrote while he was still in Burma. 
still trying to serve the Lord. God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him, but I find him not. They're sobering words, honest words. And looking from the outside, it, it could look like God had forgotten Adoniram, given up on him. But God had not forgotten about him. And later in his ministry, the Lord draws Adoniram back to himself through reminders and declarations of love, through act, countless acts of grace. In fact, Adoniram hears that his brother, whom he loved, gave his life to Christ before he died. And so from those, those evidences of God's grace, eventually he comes to a place where he writes this. There is a love that never fails. If I had not felt certain that every additional trial was offered by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated sufferings. The reality of God's love sustained him and it will sustain you. Honestly, if not for the promise of God's love, what would sustain us? And this broken and fallen world, would you hear it? Would you hear this declaration of God's love over you this morning and ask God for the help to believe it? Believe it. And even if there's a little question that comes into your mind and you're hearing that declaration this morning over and over again, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And if there's any part of your heart or your mind that begins to ask the question, how? How has God loved us? Would you see his love? Would you see this morning the declaration of love that God has given in his gospel? God has declared his love for us as his people and he has acted upon that declaration through the work of Christ. If you ever doubt the love of God, oh friends, look at the cross because there's never been a greater display of the love that God has for us than what he did for us in Jesus. This is how God has loved the world, that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. God has shown and proven his love toward us in Jesus. That's the proof. That's the proof. When we were lost in our mess, God came after us. He pursued us and called, him to, uh, called us to himself and gave us a way to be freed from our sin and walk an abundant eternal life. No greater love has man ever seen or known than the love that God has shown us in Jesus. If your circumstance leads you to doubt, ask God for his help to believe what you hear, but you look at the demonstration of his love that he has given us on that cross. And what an opportunity right now we have to look at the cross and be reminded of God's love for us through the taking of the supper. And that will be our first response this morning as the people of God, our first action and response. We get to participate, church family, and a physical act that reminds us, that is meant to remind us, declare to us the love of God for us. And so let me just take a moment to set the table for us today. This is a family meal. It's a meal that has been prepared for the, the membership, the family here at Bayleaf Baptist Church, but know that we do invite all baptized believers to join us in partaking of this meal. But we also wanna make sure that everyone who partakes of the supper is doing so in a way that offers true testimony. That's not an empty declaration, but one that is, is offered and partaken of with a heart full of love. And so we're gonna spend a moment, in just a moment, praying and, and asking God to search our hearts to make sure that we are declaring what we are supposed to declare and we are remembering what we are supposed to remember as we engage in the elements of the supper. And then for those of you who would say, I do not know Jesus. For those of you who would say that I'm not a follower of Christ or I don't know that I'm a follower of Christ. If you've never responded to the love of God, the love that God has shown you in Jesus with a heart 
opened and full of love and repentance and belief, we would ask you to abstain from taking the supper this morning, but watch. Watch the declaration of this people. As you've already heard the statement that God loves us, would you just see the collective witness of the church here saying, this is how God has loved us, that he saved us and he satisfies us. And then after our time at the supper, we're gonna give you an opportunity to respond by coming forward and, and repenting and believing in Jesus for salvation. And we'd love to walk with you through that. So wherever you are, would you just bow your heads for a moment and ask God to help you know how to act. Do you know Jesus? If you're not sure or don't know, wait. But ask God to reveal himself to you in this moment and to call you to himself to the gospel that you've seen and will, you've heard and will soon see. And for those of you who are in Christ, are you moved, overwhelmed by the love of God that he speaks over you and has acted to show you Would you ask God to use this moment to open your heart up even more and that God would draw you closer to himself? Father, would you find us faithful in this moment to offer testimony to the declaration of the supper? We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Now, is there anyone in the room who did not receive the elements, but who needs them before we partake. If you just raise your hand so our usher, our deacons can know. Over here in the corner, anybody else? And let's go ahead over here as well. Let's go ahead and prepare the elements. Let me just give you a, a word to the wise. Do the, the wafer on the bottom first before you open the juice. Anyone else? Oh, up here as well, guys. Thank you, Skeen. I'm gonna be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's what Paul writes to the church then. For I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, thank you God, he took it and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for the, the body of Christ, Father. Thank you for this moment to remember and give thanks for the physical body of Jesus. God, that he willingly left the glory of heaven and took on flesh to dwell among us so that we could behold your glory, the glory of the Father as can only be revealed through the Son that he lived the perfect sinless life that we could not live in the flesh and offered his body in our place to be broken. What a declaration of love. And we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now to the cup. In the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together and give thanks for the blood of Christ. Father, we also know in your word that you say without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Father, there would not be eternal, everlasting forgiveness of our sins if Jesus had not shed his blood but he did. And now for those of us who ask, who respond in repentance and believe, God, you willingly cover us in the blood of Christ, even though we are messes, 
you make us white as snow. Thank you. Thank you for how you've loved us and saved us in Christ. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and he is coming again, isn't he? And what a declaration of love that will be when he returns to take us home. Now's the time for us to respond in any other kind of way. If you need to pray, if you wanna ask what it means to be a follower of Jesus and pray with the pastor, a minister will be in the front. Maybe there's a place in your life where you've not been walking in obedience. You've been asking those questions and you wanna repent of that this morning because you're overwhelmed by the love of God. Or maybe you need, you need God to speak and to remind you again and again of his love for you. Would you just pray for that today? However the Lord leads you to respond, let's stand and respond faithfully right now. Thank you for joining us this week at Bayleaf. For more information about Bayleaf Baptist Church, visit our website at bayleaf.org.